I'm nervous. <laughs> hey, nervous. Hey, everybody. My name's Aldo, and I'm an addict. Hi, Aldo. Hey, everybody. And um, I guess what I need to do is just tell you a little bit about me, how I got here, I guess why I stay here, and how it is for me here. Um, I'm trying to think back to the beginning. I can remember, I started using at a very early age. I was born and raised here in Fort Pierce. You know, all my life I can remember feeling like not a part of, you know, something. You know, I always felt different. I felt like I didn't belong. But I also was that guy that, you know, I can remember like going to school in the third grade, they took me out of school, put me in a gifted program, you know, and I was, I felt like I was like separated from the friends that, you know, in the neighborhood. You know, it was like I had to wear a mask to be over here and wear a mask to be over here because I grew up like in the hood. You know, it's like my mother and father, my mother was a maid and my father, he did tile work. And I was in this school where most of these kids' parents was doctors, lawyers. And I can remember at an early age lying about what my mother and father did for a living. You know, just to fit in. You know, um, I guess in my household it's like today, I can remember I used to have a real resentment against my parents. You know, especially my father. Because my father, he drank. And when he drank, he drank. If you know what I'm talking about, drinking. You know, his deal was he would go to work from Monday through Friday. But from Friday night till Sunday night, he got wasted. And when I say wasted, he was wasted, man. And, you know, I had a real big resentment for a long time about that, you know. And But today I've come to understand that my father did the best he could with the information that he had. You know, today I understand that my father provided for his family the best way that he could. You know, and I've made peace with that. You know, it's like I always got what I wanted. You know, I've never been without. And I can remember, you know, being introduced to recovery. I think it was, I ended up in jail. And, you know, we used to hear a lot of stories about jail, you know, and I was scared as hell to go to jail. But I ended up in jail, and when I got to jail, it was like when I looked around, it was all my friends. <laughs> you know, it was like, damn, this is where you guys go, <laughs> you know. And right away, the fear left me about jail because it was nothing like what people told me it was like. You know, and I can remember being in that jail for the first time and this old guy that was sleeping above me, he said, look, man, you don't belong in here. You know, and here's what you do. You tell the people that you have a drug problem and they'll get you some help. So I did that and what happened was this lawyer got me out. I ended up in detox, new arrival, but it was... The old detox on Copenhagen Road, I think it was like 1982. And to be honest with you, I had no intentions of stopping. The only reason that I went was to be the case and to get back in the house. That was it. You know, I can remember being there and I can remember being introduced to this program when they bought a meeting out. It wasn't this program, it was AA. They brought this AA meeting out, right? And I can remember sitting in that meeting in the back, and at the end I was arguing with this guy like, look man, I know you get high, I know you drink, I know you do something. So you cannot tell me that you're clean, you don't do nothing. You know, I can remember that. And I can remember telling those people that, yeah, the minute that I get out of here, I'm going to continue doing what I'm doing. I just got this one small problem, man. I cannot manage my money when I do a certain thing. <laughs> and I truly, honestly believe that. The day I got out was the day that I went and got out. You know, I told myself that what I would do was I would just smoke a little weed and drink a little bit. 
And if I can leave the rest alone, I'll be all right. But I was the type of guy, I didn't drink a lot because I made a promise to myself that I wouldn't be like my father. That's the reason that I didn't drink. And about the only time that I would drink was when I couldn't get nothing else just to take the edge off because it would put me to sleep. You know, if you're an addict like me, I did a lot of things and I'm not proud of to get what I thought I needed. You know, for me, I was a low bottom, down hard crack addict. I was a type of addict that would sell his shoes and try and steal them back. <laughs> you know, and I can remember one night selling my coat, man, to this guy and I stole the coat back and he caught me with the coat because I came back to the same house, the cop again, you know, and that's how I thought, you know, but I need to say this here, man, because this, this is really, um, this really blows my mind because it's like I've never met anybody in my life, man, that was out to hurt me. Even in the dope house, in the streets, the dope man, I never met anybody in my life that was out to hurt me. They were all out to help me. But I could not see it then, you know. I can remember the dope man telling me, look, man, you don't belong here. Look, man, <laughs> you can do better than what you're doing. You know, I can remember, you know, the guys in the street that I used to get high with, man, this ain't for you. But little did I know that I had a disease, man, and it was called addiction. You know, I really believe that it was a mind over matter thing, you know, because I can remember, man, having good intentions, you know, that I ain't getting high today. I can remember having good intentions, man, that I ain't going to take the money out my mother's purse today. I can remember, you know, if I am going to take it, you know, I'm going to put it back. See, this is the shit that I used to tell myself. And I really believe that deep down. But for some reason, it's like none of that never manifested. And as a result, man, I always felt like no matter what I did, it always turned to you know what. No matter what my intentions were, I always got the short end. You know, I just, I, and I really believed when I got here that I had a moral deficiency. You know, I, I had this mental problem going on. You know, I just could not buy that, you know, a chemical could control me that way. You know, I couldn't understand that thing called being powerless. You know, I remember catching another case, man, and they sent me to this drug treatment center. And it was a relief for me because I said, finally, man, I'm going to get the help that I need. And I can remember walking into this place called Spectrum down in Miami, right? And, it was, and back then, it, it, they called them TCs. You know, it was like I was sentenced for a year to 18 months. And I was okay with it. It beat jail, you know. I was all right with it. And um, I can remember standing by the front gate, and this guy came to see me. This guy by the name of Hanif, we're very good friends today, man. He was my first sponsor. And I asked him, I said, well, man, when do I get to see the psychiatrist? And he looked at me like, psychiatrist? <laughs> he said, no, man, <laughs> you know, we don't work that way. And, and what they do is, back then, what they would do is they would yell and scream at you, man, and make you wear diapers, shave your head, all kinds of shit, right? You know, and believe it or not, man, it was like the clients ran the house. You know, the only thing a counselor did was like facilitate a group. And my favorite group there was, we had what we call confrontation groups. That meant I could tell you about your ass, you know what I mean? <laughs> that meant that I could get my anger out on you and not, you know, receive any consequences for it. And that was like my favorite group, <laughs> you know, because when I got here, I was very angry, you know. 
When I got here, man, it was like I had a real problem with prejudice. You know, when I got here, I can remember the first meeting here in Fort Pierce it was over at the college. And it was six people in that meeting. And I can remember walking up those stairs, and when I looked in the room, it was like an Indian, a hippie, and some motorcycle guy. It was some other off-the-wall girl, and I was like, man, I don't belong here, you know? And believe it or not, we all got to be good friends. Maybe Mike probably knows some of them people. Some of those people are still around today. You know, but I can remember that, man. I can remember when I first walked into the rooms of narcotics and arms, I immediately, immediately disqualified myself because I wasn't like y'all. The only thing my problem was, was I had a problem mentally, and if I could find the right doctor, talk to the right person, I'd be okay. And I can remember being down in that treatment center, man, you know, they used to take us out to meetings. And I can remember going to that first speaker meeting, and I can remember listening to this guy talk about shooting dope in his neck, shooting dope in his groin, and I looked at him and I said, I don't belong here, <laughs> you know? And it gave me a license to continue doing what I was doing because I really believe my sick mind told me that, man, my story wasn't, it wasn't bad enough to be here. You know, I hadn't done enough to qualify to be here, you know, and I really didn't want to be an addict, you know, and um, I can remember, it's like I never did graduate that program, I left one Sunday, i never forget it, man, the council told me Sunday, let me have my car, you know, you work these stages, they let me have my car. He told me something I didn't like. I told him to kiss my ass. I jumped in my car and I hauled ass. And by the time I made the Palm Beach, I was high. I had forgot I was on probation. I was doing three years probation. And what I did was a smart person that I am went straight to my probation officer and told her what happened. You know, it was their fault, not my fault. You know, and she said, okay, we'll try you on the streets. But, you know, for some reason in my life, I always had people that were out to help me. This lady said, look, I do everything in my power. Just, I'm going to try you on the street. And it wasn't seven days later, I was right back in jail for the same thing. And on my way to another facility. And this facility was called the Village South, down in Miami off of Biscayne Boulevard. I'll never forget it. They came and got me, and I went in leg iron shackles and waist chains. And I can never forget, the guy made me walk down Biscayne Boulevard to go into the office, you know, like I was a murderer or something. I mean, everybody's watching me. And i never forget that first day in that program, this woman by the name of Janice stood me up, and I really thought that she was going to, like, you know, welcome me. You know, and <laughs> how you doing? And she stood me up, man, in front of all these people, man. And she basically pulled my whole car, told me what I was about, and told me why I was there. And I hated her guts. But the one thing I do know is that for some reason, we can tell when somebody cares about us you know, it's like I came into the rooms where when you raise your hand as a newcomer, they used to tell you to shut the fuck up. <laughs> you know, nope, you ain't got nothing to say. And it used to really hurt my feelings. <laughs> you know, I can remember wanting to fight in meetings. I can remember, you know, telling people, you know, it, it's like... I know what I'm talking about, you know, just give me a chance, you know, but it's like today I understand that those guys really love me, they cared about me, they did everything in their power, man, to see me stay clean that extra day, but it was my will, you know, because when I walked into this fellowship, I came with a very, very closed mind, man, the only thing I thought my problem was, I thought it was dope. I can remember being here, man, and y'all was talking all that other stuff, and I was like, nope, I'm not using it today, I'm okay. 
you know. And for me, it's like, for some reason, it's like addicts. When we stop using, we clean up real fast. You know, usually we get new clothes, you know, we probably get that car, you know, we get that new job. You know, the family began to talk to us, and for some reason, man, I thought I was okay. You know, and I can remember being in this fellowship, man, for many years. Many years, figuring that, hey, man, I really did not have to do what you do to stay clean. You know, I really believe that I kept me clean. But today I realize that it's only by God's grace and mercy, man, that I sit here today. You know, because today I realize, man, I got a lot of friends, man. I got friends doing life. I got friends that's dead, man. I got friends that I hung out with there on the corner just as hard as they did right beside them, man, and they ain't sitting here today. You know, I can remember, man, the day that I surrendered to this disease, man, it was like it. December 1st, 1986. I can remember that last trip to detox. You know, and, and it's, it was like, for the first time in my life, man, my mother. You talk, We talk about unconditional love in here. See, the day I know that my mother has unconditional love for me. Because no matter what shit I put her through, she was always there for me. You know, but I can remember that last time going to the house, man, and, and I'm telling her, look, you know, I, I'm going to get some help, but I need your help. And she looked me in her eyes with tears in her eyes, and she told me, man, she didn't care if I got clean. She didn't care if I kept using. She, 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 she said, the deal is, is that we can't take it anymore. I can't take it anymore. I can't keep hurting like this anymore. And she told me I was on my own. And for the first time in my life, man, I felt like I was all alone. For the first time in my life, man, I felt like it was just me against the world. And I walked up to detox that night. They didn't want to let me in. Now here I am, a regular. You know, I come all the time. <laughs> but but the lady was like, hey, you know, um, what, what, you just want to get back in the house? You know, you, what you want to get back with your family? And she was like, I don't think so. And I can remember begging that lady, man. Her name was Shirley. i never forget, I begged her, please let me in. And she let me in that night. And I can remember getting on my knees that night, man. And I can remember praying, man, just God, just help me. And it was no conditions this time. You know, before it would be God, help me. Get me out of this one, and I'm going to do this. Get me out of that one, I'm going to do that. <laughs> but this time was just help me. You know, I was willing to go to any length to do whatever I had to do to stop hurting the way that I was hurt. And it wasn't about using, it was about how, when I used, how it made me feel. It was about, when I looked in the eyes of my family members, man, my friends, it was how it made me feel. I could not bear that pain anymore. And I can remember waking up that morning and in detox they have this little circle group when you first get there. You know, I remember this like yesterday because I knew about, I see a third of the room, right? Some of them I used with on the streets and, and my thing was I had this image, you know. I couldn't let them see me cry. I couldn't let them see me hurt because they was going to talk about it. But I can remember that lady asking me, she said, well, what you going to do now? You know, all before I always had an answer. Well, I'm going to get a sponsor, you know. I'm going to work the steps. I'm going to go to meetings. I'm going to get phone numbers. I always had an answer, right? But for the first time in my life, man, I did not know what the hell I was going to do. And all I could do was just cry. I did everything in my power to hold back those tears, man, because I didn't want to let the boys see me cry. Motherfuckers in detox now. <laughs> I'm worried about them and how they think about me. But the well broke. 
you know, it was one of those cries where, you know, like the snot come down <laughs> and you can't stop the, <laughs> you know, and it was one of those, man, because I honestly did not know what I was going to do. And I can remember sitting in that detox and I was feeling very, very hopeless and helpless. Because I really felt that I just couldn't get this. And they used to bring a meeting in the detox, right? H&I meeting. And that Tuesday night, a dude that I used to hang out on the streets with, he's no longer in this fellowship, you know, and I love him to death. He's like my brother. But he brung the meeting in that night. And when I looked up, I'm going to tell you how my mind works. When I looked up and seen him speaking, first thing my mind said was, damn, if he can do it, because he's a hell of, hell of a lot worse off than me, <laughs> I know I got a shot. And I can remember getting his phone number, and he told me, say, ah, man, when you get out, man, call me, and I'll take you to a meeting. And the day I got out, I called him. And I'm going to say his name, Horace. I called Horace, man. Because Horace used to, he was like a very integral part of this, this area here at one point in time. And Horace came and got me. And I went to my first meeting. You know, back then the meetings was very small. You know, and... I was the type of person, like I told you, I came in here with a lot of issues, man. And one of my biggest issues was prejudice. You know, it's something that I've worked through. Because I truly believe that God put people in our lives today, man, to help us, in spite of us. Because it was like, this guy used to bring in the meeting to the prison, right? And I was in this facility, man, and he used to come all the time. And I kind of liked the guy, you know, he was a white boy, right? <laughs> but I liked him because he used to talk to me, bring me coffee, candy and shit, <laughs> you know. And, you know, and I just knew that I would never see this guy again. But it's like when I got out of detox, I started going to meetings. And when I walked into that meeting, I seen him. And I was like, what the hell he's doing here? He lived in Palm Beach. And um, he was like, oh, my father moved a business up here, so I'm living up here now. And he became my second sponsor. And he was my sponsor for about, for about 10 years. And I can remember Bubba, man. Bubba used to drive from Vero every night, come get me for a meeting, come through the hood. You know, and I would talk to him about my problems. You know, I would talk to him about, you know, how I didn't feel a part of when I walked in the meeting. How I didn't like this one and that one, you know. And, and it was all my shit, <laughs> you know. And he would always tell me, I was like, man, ain't no black people, man. They don't understand me. They couldn't possibly understand what I done been through. Yeah, they talk that mess, but they ain't, I ain't never seen them over there, you know. And um, he would tell me, well, you just stick and stay for the brother that comes after you. And he used to drill that into me. And I stayed for a long time, you know, and it was like... After hanging out with Horace and started going to meetings, man, I, I used to, I went to a, we talk about service around here. I went to this meeting. They tricked me into this meeting, right? And what the meeting was, a H and I subcommittee meeting. I didn't know what the hell it was, but they said they needed somebody to go in detox. You know, but they had like these, at that time I thought they were huge clean time requirements. You know, but, you know, back then we waived everything, right, Mike? <laughs> well, you waived, you know, I got 30, you wave, you can go. <laughs> you know, take the message. You know, and um, I got tricked into doing detox, and I did detox for about eight years. You know, and I can remember we used to fight to go in the detox, because you, can, we, you would only allow, like, three people, I believe. And, like, six of us would show up, right? <laughs> 
and we would fight who's going in tonight. But I did that commitment, man, for a long time. And I can remember, man, how I used to feel when I would go into detox and I would tell them, like, oh, it's so nice to be clean, how to stay clean, you know, where to get clean. And I had all the answers for them, right? And I remember talking to my sponsor about it, man, and my sponsor said, nope. He said, man, I want to come with you. And I'm going to show you how to do an H&I meeting. Mm -hmm. He came with me and I got ready to say my little speech, you know. And he said, nope, I'm going to do this tonight. And what he did was he simply introduced those people to Narcotics Anonymous. That's all he did. And I was like, that's it? <laughs> and through that experience, what I found out was, man, that... I was really doing that meeting for the wrong reasons because the reason that I did that meeting was y'all made me feel good. I felt a little better than y'all, you know. I had a little more stuff than y'all, you know. I had it going on. And what he told me was, no, man, it's about carrying the message in a selfless manner. You know, my job is simply to, is to introduce you to plant the seed and hey, they say you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. That's my job today. You know, it's like um, I really got involved in service in this fellowship. You know, from a group level to an area level to a regional level. And I got to meet a lot of people, you know. And I can remember, man, at five years clean, man, I really felt like you know, I used to hang out with these people that had a lot of years, right? And to me, they was like gods. You know, they had to have it going on. I can remember being at this regional conference, and we went out to dinner. It was about 20 of us. And I had the less amount of time at that table. And I felt like I really didn't belong. I felt like I didn't know enough. But after listening to them guys talk around that table, what I found out was we all got the same problem. And it's called addiction. And what I found out was that our addiction can manifest itself in many, many areas of my life today. What I found out was that, man, all we are is just human beings. You know? And we face with an uncurable disease called addiction. What I found out was that, man, I'm not better than, I'm not less than, I just am. This is who I am, Aldos. For some reason, when I got here, I thought that when I raised my hand and shared, man, that I had to have something profound to say. You know, but what I've learned today is, all I got to do is share my experience, strength, and hope with how I stay clean. All I need to share is what I'm going through today, man. It's like I wouldn't trade my process for nothing in the world because that's what it has been, man, because it's been a process of coming to believe that something greater than me, man, can show me how to live because what I knew about living almost killed me. <laughs> and it took me many years to come to that conclusion. You know, y'all got these little sayings around here you know, like easy does it. One day at a time. Just for the day. I, could, I, I didn't understand none of that shit, man. I was like, what are they talking about, man? It's like my mission is, man, I need to get me a good job, man. I need to get a car. It's like I got married in recovery because I really thought it would make me normal. You know? I mean... It's like I wouldn't trade that experience for the world, but at the day I know that I got married for all the wrong reasons. You know, what I strive for when I got here was normalcy, man. I really did not want to hang out here for no damn 20 years. You know, I used to hear people got 25. Uh, man, I don't want to be around y'all for that long. You know, I should be able to like pass the test and get on with my life. <laughs> But what I found out was, man, that recovery is a process. What I found out was that 
You know, every day, man, it's like my surrender to this process deepens. It's like my commitment deepens. It's like, you know, today I realize, man, that, you know, we talk about steps around here, and I really believe, this is my personal belief, that the steps is my personal recovery. That's for me. You know, I believe that it's a million and one ways to recover, man. And whatever benefits you, let it benefits you, man. And what benefits me, let it benefits me. Today, I've come to the belief, man, that, yeah, I do believe in that spiritual principle of anonymity. Because no one in this room can tell you that I talk about anybody today. Because today I know that, but by the grace of God, there go I. See, the day I got some people in my life that I can talk to about anything that happens in my life. And I don't have to fear them judging me about it. You know, I just got off the phone with my sponsor coming here, man. And, and the relationship that we have, you know, I hear a lot of people say, Oh, my sponsor told me I got to write this, do this, do that. You know, I got a sponsor that... What we are, man, is we got a relationship. We talk to each other. He got shit, I got shit. You know, he get crazy, I get crazy. You know, he listen to me, I listen to him. It's a two-way street. And I really believe that sponsorship is the backbone of this ship, man. I believe that without y'all, man, I could not recover. You know? It's like, um, I listened to the readings today. I, I've learned how to listen around here. It's like when he read the traditions, man, what stands out to me, money, property, and prestige will divert me from my primary purpose. And see, I forget that my purpose here today is to be clean, stay clean a day at a time. That's my primary purpose. Man, my primary pur purpose ain't to get a brand new car, man. That's just icing on the cake. See, my problem in life has been that, hey, man, I want the cake and I want to eat it too. It's like, I want to be clean, man, but I still want to live dirty. I still want to go on the corner, and I did. I still want to play with the girls, I did. You know, I didn't care about your feelings. What I cared about was my feel good. Because when I put the drugs down, I had to find something to fill that void because it was like I really didn't have a real God in my understanding, you know? It's like I really hadn't worked any steps. You know, yeah, I read them. I can tell you all about our text. But you know what? What I found out was I can't talk my way out of what I done behave my way into. <laughs> See, what the steps has taught me is it has sort of helped me deal with the harsh realities of my life today. <coughs> and I ain't saying my life is all bad, man. Today, you know, recovery has been good to me. I got a great life. You know, I'm a hell of a son in my mind. You know, I'm a decent father in my mind and I think I'm a damn good friend I'm a damn good employee you know but I owe that all to you people here in this fellowship you know it's like um, recovery is what you make it man you know, it's like, we don't got away from some of the old sayings that we used to say around here. It's like, when we used to say, like, in the beginning, you know, what I used to hear all the time was, hey, man, the newcomer is the most important person in this meeting. You know, because we can't keep what we have unless we give it away. But for a long time, I had to realize I ain't have nothing to give you, man. You know, I can tell you a whole lot of stories about what goes on in this fellowship, but I'm here to tell you, man, that everybody sitting up here ain't about recovery. You know, 
the day the harsh reality of it is that everybody sitting around this table won't be here next year. You know, you know, it's like when I got here, man, I was living in a fantasy world. And what, you know, recovery has given me, man, is a way to deal with reality. You know, and um, I don't know, it's, the day is like I believe in our text only. I don't listen to too much shit that's shared around the rooms. What I do today is I read my text. I read the step working guide. I read the, it works how and why. And that's where I get my answers from. Because for a long time, I used to come to this room thinking that I would find a solution to my problem. And what I found out was, all I found was a bunch of goddamn opinions. <laughs> you know? And some of those opinions will get you in trouble. You know, it's like, um, if you talk to me after the meeting, I can probably give you all the answers that you want to hear. But the, what I found out, man, is that recovery is a simple, it's a simple process for complicated people. And I think what the process for me has been is through the steps, man, it only just helps me to get closer to a God of my understanding. Because for a long time, what cut me off from being close to that God of my understanding, having that conscious contact was that, yeah, God, I want to do your will, but yeah, God, I want to go in the corner tonight. Forgive me later. You know, it was like, I wanted to do a lot of things that was not conducive to what, how, how I want to put this, to living right. But that's all I ever wanted to do, was just live right and be okay with me. See, because today, man, I know when I'm doing something that's not conducive to the way that I want to live today. You know, it's like I ain't going to sit here and tell you that I'm perfect. Yeah, I got issues. I talk about them today. I've gotten better with them today. But the day I realize, man, that it's nothing that I can change about me, man. That I pray to a God of my understanding to remove those defects of characters, man. To help me with those shortcomings. And for some reason, they just fall by the wayside. Because if it was up to me, man, I would be a perfect little being up here. But the bottom line is, I get angry, I throw shit, I cuss, you know, I lust. <laughs> I do all that stuff and a whole lot more. But the difference is, the day is that I'm beginning, beginning to be more and more aware of it, you know. I got people to talk to about it. You know, the day I'm not ashamed of it today. Because for many years, that's what ran my life. Remorse, shame, and guilt. You know, I always had that little dark secret back there that I wouldn't tell nobody that y'all ain't going to know. And I always wondered why I felt like I was in prison all the time. But the day I truly understand when we talk about freedom in this program, this is my belief only in my experience through working the steps, making some amends, and trying to stay right with a God of my understanding. See, the day I can look another human being in the eye and know that I ain't did nothing, man. I ain't did nothing out of the ordinary today. And that's the freedom that I believe we talk about around here. See, because abstinence, you know, anybody can abstain. You know? But the day I realized that abstinence is it, it, not it's not recovery, man. But it is the key. And the day I realized, man, that, hey, it's a lot more than not putting a drug in your body today. And I think I'm babbling. I'm going to give it a rest. And I want to thank you guys for listening to me, man. And it's great to be at another Narcotics Anonymous meeting. And...